Hello everyone. In this lecture, we will discuss a very basic approach on how to read an ECG. We will not go into too many details, just a simple overview that will help you understand a systemic approach to an ECG when you see it in your exam or your daily practice. ECG stands for electrocardiogram and it is a graphical representation of our heartbeat. Before we start interpretation of an ECG, we should know the basic components of a healthy heartbeat. This is an ECG paper and this is one healthy heartbeat. First we will look at the waves. So here is the P wave, then Q, R, S wave, then T wave and finally sometimes you can see a very small U wave at the end of the T wave. P wave represents atrial depolarization or in simple words you can say atrial contraction. QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization that is ventricular contraction. T wave represents ventricular repolarization that is ventricular relaxation and U wave represents Purkinje fiber repolarization or relaxation. You cannot see any wave representing atrial repolarization or relaxation because it is masked under ventricular contraction, that is the QRS complex. The second component is segments. Segments are basically isoelectric lines or flat lines. They are called isoelectric because there is no electrical activity during this time. The two important segments you have to remember is the PR segment and the ST segment. The PR segment starts at the end of the P wave till the beginning of the Q wave and the ST segment starts at the end of the QRS complex till the beginning of T wave. The third component is intervals. There are two important intervals, PR interval and QT interval. The PR interval starts at the beginning of P wave and ends at the beginning of QRS complex. The QT interval starts at the beginning of QRS complex and it ends till the end of T wave. Normal PR interval is 3 to 5 small squares and normal QT interval is between 9 to 11 small squares. Finally, you should know the 12 leads of ECG and which areas of the heart do they represent. This is especially important when you have to diagnose myocardial infarction. Leads 1, 2, 3 AVR, AVL and AVF, they are the limb leads and leads V1 till V6 are chest leads or precordial leads. Look at this diagram and memorize it. Leads V1 and V2 represent septal area of the heart whereas V3 and V4 represent anterior area of the heart. Sometimes all these four uh, leads are affected so you can say the anterior septal area of the heart is affected. The inferior leads are 2, 3 and AVF. 1, AVL, V5 and V6 are the lateral leads. And the lead AVR is uh, commonly ignored and it is called as a neglected lead. Now let's learn how to read an ECG. Whenever you see an ECG, first step is look at the heart rate. Is it normal, fast or slow? In books, they teach you a formula that divides 300 by the number of boxes between the R waves, etc, etc. But you know what? You don't have time to do that in your exam. Also, no one is going to ask you in MRCP or USMLE to calculate heart rate. Just look at this ECG, especially the longest strip. The successive R waves are away from each other at a very normal distance, right? So this looks like a normal ECG, a normal heart rate. Now compare this ECG with this one. Here if you see the distance between the two R waves is decreased. They have come closer to each other. So that means that the heart is beating fast. It's tachycardia. Similarly, look at this ECG. The R waves are quite away from each other. The distance has increased. The number of boxes has increased. So the, this means that the heart is beating slower than normal. So that's bradycardia. The next step is to look at the rhythm, for which you have to look at the P wave first. The best leads to look at is lead 2 and V1. If P waves are present, then it is a sinus rhythm. Then you see if it is a regular rhythm or an irregular rhythm. If the R waves are equally away from each other, then it is a regular rhythm, otherwise it's not. 
For example, if you look at this ECG, are there P waves? Yes, there are P waves. So it is a sinus rhythm. Is it regular? No, it's not regular because the R waves are not equally away from each other. The first three are a bit equal, but the fourth one is a bit further away. So it is an irregular rhythm. This is known as sinus arrhythmia. The third step is to look at the axis, whether it's normal axis, left axis deviation, or right axis deviation. The leads you have to look at is lead 1, 2, and AVF. If the QRS complex is positive in lead 1, 2, and AVF, that is all are upgoing, then it is a normal axis. If the lead is downward, the QRS complex is downward, negative in lead 1, whereas in 2 and AVF they're upgoing, that is the 2 and AVF are returning to lead 1, then it is right axis deviation. This is how I remember it, like a mnemonic. Now in left axis deviation what happens that the QRS is positive in lead 1 whereas in lead 2 and AVF it's negative. Like 2 and AVF they are leaving lead 1. So that is left axis deviation. Fourth step is to look at the intervals. That is PR interval and QT interval. Previously I mentioned that PR interval is normally 3 to 5 small squares. If you look at this ECG, I'll zoom in here, the PR interval is literally just 1 to 2 small squares. So it is a short PR interval. This is an ECG of WPW syndrome. Normal QT interval is 9 to 11 small squares. So if I zoom in this ECG, the QT interval is almost 1, 2 and 3 big squares, which is 15 small squares. That means that this is an ECG of long QT interval. Next, you have to look at the morphology of P waves and QRS complex because in some conditions their shape can change. For example, bifid P waves in mitral stenosis or narrow and broad complex uh, tachycardias. Also, you have to see if each P wave is followed by a QRS complex or not. For example, if you see in this ECG, there after this P wave, there is no QRS complex. That means there is a drop beat. This is a Mopitz type 2 heart block. So their relationship is important in diagnosing different types of heart blocks. Next step is to look at the segments, that is PR segment and ST segment. Segments are supposed to be straight lines, but in this ECG, it is very clear that the PR segment is depressed, down sloping. This is a very characteristic sign of pericarditis. To diagnose MI, the ST elevation should be at least in more than one small square in all leads or more than two small squares in V2 and V3. Elevation should be in at least two contiguous leads, which means that it should be in at least two leads which represent the same area of the heart. For example, in this ECG, there is ST elevation of more than one square in V1, of more than two small squares in V2, more than three small squares in V3, and very slight elevation in V4 as well. So this is basically anteroseptal MI. For ST depression, it should be more than 0.5 small square, that is just half small square ST depression can diagnose and STEMI, uh, but it should also be in at least two contiguous leads. For example, in this ECG, if you see, there is ST depression in V2, there is ST depression in V3, there is also ST depression in V4. So this is an anteroseptal and STEMI. The last step is to look at the T wave. Basically, you have to see the shape of T wave because the morphology of T wave can indicate certain diseases. For example, inverted T waves can represent ischemic heart disease or a new infarction. Also, tall tented T waves is a classical sign of hyperkalemia. So these are the seven steps in summary. How to approach an ECG? First you look at rate. Normal, tachycardia, predicardia. Rhythm, is it sinus, regular or irregular? Axis, normal, left axis deviation or right axis deviation? Intervals, is it normal, shortened or prolonged? P waves and QRS complexes, is their morphology normal? The relationship is normal or not? Segments, are the straight lines elevated or depressed? And finally, T waves, is the morphology of T wave normal or not? And that's it for today. In the next lecture, we'll discuss some important ECGs 
that are commonly asked in our exams.